Welcome. My name's Douglas Hagstrom. Um, I'm from the Innovation Office um, at the University of Basel, and together with Candice over there, we've been running the Marahi program for a year. I'm also very proudly wearing my um, Innovation Hub polo, which Masood gave me um, uh, when he was visiting here in September, which is when, together with Nasis over there, um, we actually hatched the idea of today. Um, and I thought we'd start actually with um, that idea. So I'll start presenting for those who are online. Um, I'd like to begin with asking a question from a few people in terms of, of why are you actually here? Um, and what are you trying to do with your startup? So um, I'll start with, with me. Um, I'm here because I think it's great to actually think about what an innovator is and an entrepreneur is in terms of global health and the opportunity to bring together a number of different people was made me think it was worthwhile. Um, I'll throw over to Nassis. You're the... Yeah, I can see I'm here because I believe that uh, um, we are trying to raise entrepreneurship in the South, in low and income countries, and uh, I think that we can also learn from them. So, yeah. yeah. So some shared learning. Um, I'll pick on someone else. Thomas. I think I'm here because uh, it's a great chance to get some feedback on the ideas that we have, how we can promote entrepreneurship and also see how others perceive these ideas or have some, some ideas about that. It's really about the exchange. Great. Um, sorry, the lady in the yellow jacket. Yeah, so we are here to learn from each other as we had someone, uh, everyone has an idea and we can see how we can collaborate or we can make the uh, uh, the, the, the way better place to live. Yeah. But um, does anyone from online want to unmute themselves and say hello and why they've joined today? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Zaki Ntema. I'm a chief research scientist from Ifakara. And uh, absolutely, I'm here because I believe. Um, uh, it's a learning process and it's by doing where the idea came from. So I want to really learn quite a number of things and hear what other people are doing. I'm also CEO and co-founder of Sky Connect, a digital solution company. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Zach. Other reason we're here a little bit is, is these words, which actually when we um, began to write like, hey, we should invite people, let's do this. Um, and Masood from, uh, from Ifakara wrote these sort of words. And I think it's true and it um, puts a little bit in perspective this idea that there's a gap between research and practice in Tanzania. Um, and, and I think you could probably say there's a gap between research and practice globally, but it's particularly relevant um, in this context. And we think that the people in this room have a chance to, to help to fill that gap. Um, so, Masood, do you want to share a little bit about what you were thinking about when you said that? Uh, absolutely. I'm in Kenya. I'm attending uh, Innovation Week Kenya. So thank you, Doug, Nalsis, and everyone who has attended this um, summit. So just to give a little bit background uh, for Ifakara Innovation Hub and where this idea came from, and how we are trying to address this gap. So um, as much of you may, may not know, um, the Fagara's uh, research organization has been doing research over 50 years. And now at, at some point we came with the question, um, what next after, after the research findings? So this is one of the, the focus area where we are trying to, to address the, through innovation as a, as a tool towards coming up with answers so now the question was, how can we capitalize or how can we um, now commercialize the, the research into something tangible? So this is one of the reasons why we wanted to have the innovation hub. And then from that point, also another big gap in, in Tanzania. And I think this is 
uh, most of countries in, uh, in third world countries. It's, um, so for example, Tanzania has been engaging itself with the innovation for almost over a decade now, but um, currently one of the major issues we're facing is trying to, um, to build um, investable startups and also having innovators who can be able to come up with the idea and then trying to build the idea from the ideation stage to prototyping until commercial ready um, stage. So this is where now um, the big gap is. It's one is trying to see how can we uh, try to translate the existing research and findings into technological commercialization, which is a very huge gap in terms of technology commercialization. And also another big gap is now having these young innovators who are coming with very brilliant ideas, but how can they materialize um, their ideas, the brilliant ideas? So they are the two major gaps we, we are trying to work uh, as an innovation hub. And uh, this is why we had um, a big collaboration between um, Africa and Switzerland, and also trying to reach out different uh, potential key players who can help us to uh, to beat this gap. And then we came up with this idea of having um, uh, medical device uh, innovation, which is one of the areas which is still underutilized when it comes to um, hardware innovation in Tanzania. And, uh, and then after the end of this, this is why we came up with uh, having um, uh, different partners from Kenya, from Switzerland, and also uh, different mega spaces from Tanzania. So this is just a little bit background on the why we are here today and having this kind of cooperation between uh, Switzerland ecosystem and also Tanzania ecosystem when it comes to health and innovation in general. So I think this is just in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Masood. Um, as Masood said, like what we're trying to do is help young innovators to actually make something that's investable, that's a product that's sustainable, that can actually make a difference over time. And this isn't a problem for just the Ifakara Innovation Hub and the PDP Forum, but it's actually something that we at the Innovation Office at the University of Basel, who are kind of in the middle here, um, are thinking about a lot. Um, how can we make that a difference there? And um, EPFL and uh, the Essential Tech Centre there and the Swiss TPH, who've been doing amazing work and amazing research for for decades also haven't solved this problem. Like the challenge of bringing something to healthcare um, and to market and being sustainable in global health is really hard. So that's why we wanted to bring you all together um, and present and meet each other. So it's about um, the different people that are represented on this slide actually um, meeting each other. So now um, we'll talk about what actually happens today. Um, we're going to have some pitches and presentations, and it's not about a one-way direction. Um, it's actually about um, how can we work together and things today, and, and Candice will, will talk a little bit about how practically we do that. All right, the pitching process. Candice will be, the, uh, will be the timekeeper to that. What uh, I'd like to do is invite uh, the team from Lyra up, to give your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rahima Sadani. I'm the founder of uh, Neo Health Innovations, and uh, I have a background of investment. Well, <clears throat> about in this year, about forty-eight, about forty-eight newborns died from every from every other life loss. And uh, there are so many causes of the death of these newborns. Among of them is mental asphyxia, trauma, infections, sepsis, and prematurity. But it's mostly about 57.2% of these deaths are associated with uh, hypothermia. When we speak about neonatal hypothermia, is uh, when a baby is incapable of maintaining their own temperature. So the temperature drops between 6 to 12 hours after birth. So we came up with a simple solution. It's a medical device, which is open made, and it's maintaining the baby's body temperature uh, in African health facilities. 
it's uh, it's local made user friendly affordable price. It also have a backup power supply. It's a robust in design, low cost to maintenance. This is the picture of our simple design, first model for our design. Our business model is basically we focus on selling, selling the, 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 the devices and also the maintenance services. Uh, also, we, we are going to rent the, the devices to the local hospitals, public hospitals. Uh, currently, we have, there's no local manufacturer for the products, the same products of ours, and the existing ones are old and broken, which were donated in the public hospitals. But then there are imported warmers which are uh, not sustainable, <clears throat> are not sustainable to the local environment. So uh, basically, the imported the imported baby warmers are very high in maintenance costs, but also they are very sophisticated for local environment, and then uh, there's no quick technical support. When you come to the incubators, there are few, and many of them are donated in public hospitals. They are too sophisticated. And they, they need high skill labor in order to maintain them in order to operate them. But in our case, we 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 are, we have quick technical support, and then it's portable is to transport backup power supply, and also there's a low maintenance cost for it. So our market market is uh, the health facilities, the primary health facilities, and also dispensaries and other local facilities. So currently we are in the registration process to build in customer generation. We also have a, uh, a design for products. We also, we are going to do the report styling. Again, we are going to do, we are, we are going to do the, to produce the minimum viable products. And also we are going to test to the local public health facilities. And the next, uh, we are going to produce the mass production of our products. We are also going to expand our products and services across the East Africa. We're asking to raise like uh, 9,000, 9,000, uh, $9,000 for minimum value products production, mass production and service expansion across East Africa. And this is a summary for the products. The aim is to help the health, healthcare providers to, to get to be able to access the products in order to maintain the temperature of newborn babies in the health facilities. So this is our team. Uh, there is a marketing and PR manager who is a Dr. Amik. He's working in Innovation IHI, Innovation uh, Institute. Also, we have uh, Omari, who is the technical and production manager, basically in all the production activities, the technical. And also, we have Sanofi, who is a research and development manager. So, thank you. Thank you, Rahima. Uh, apologies from my side. Any questions? A couple of minutes of questions. Uh, I have a question. Beyond your need for investment, the $93,000, is there anything specific that you would like to have helped you? Yes, uh, we, we also would like to have collaboration, partnership, uh, and also uh, if, if somebody is interested to join our team, also we, we are free. There is a room for collaboration. Maybe one of the questions that, that was also discussed in the past is regarding the design of your product. There will be a technical part who is uh, expecting, you know, to make more designs of our products. We will come also. Okay. And what would you like to offer? What can Lira and Rahima oh. offer to, to other startups that are here or? Um, uh, in a in a business perspective, I guess. Uh, yeah, even in maybe preparation of finances and uh, the customer gen validation, yes, I think uh, uh, yes. They can help you test your product in a yes in the real life. Yes. Okay. Uh, that it's really interesting. Thanks for presenting that. What is the regulatory requirements for procurement by the Ministry of Health? Uh, there are, there are different departments, I mean, governmental departments, which they give you license to acquire, you need to register your product and then they'll, they'll give you the qualification of materials that you need to produce for your product. And then they'll test the products after the 
the first maybe products you you produce the plan of maybe to produce more and more. After that, you go to the market commercial. Yeah. Okay, then we're going to continue a little bit on the same theme or a similar theme with the next presentation. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Rima. And the next is the newborn thermal control. Okay, greetings by everyone. My name is Dr. Emmanuel Wood. I'm the co-founder of, of Newborn Thermal Control Company Limited. Professionally, I'm a doctor dealing with reduction fighting in the reduction against maternal and maternal death in primary health care facility in Tanzania, experience for 10 years up to now. Now, problem in Tanzania, uh, as you can see, and five, five children in health, one had the life death died, and the five so three newborns baby in every 100 life based died in the first 28 days of neonatal life. You can see the causes, other causes are preventable, like trauma infection in the premature. But the percentage of causes, the teeny percent is congenital. So, so challenges bearing, facing the peripheral health care facility in Tanzania. You can see this is how it looks like. Here is a postnatal ward, no, no any warming system for the baby, no incubator. No, warm, no, no radiant warm and so modern incubator available only in a few private and public hospital for and far from referral centers. So those modern incubator and private hospitals they use when they still with mature baby, they manage it for only one day for slightly. 100 USD for one day. So it's very expensive. So many, when you are mothers here are poor from peripheral zone, you can't be able to provide the service, the money, so that their babies are evacuated. Sometimes the babies should die. You need to pay for that. If you haven't, you can't be able to get that service. For me, as a clinician, I'm a clinician, but they are much passion of that, see? that's why this is my solution. I have a starting with modified incubator. This is cheap. This is cheap incubators, as you can see. Maintain the temperature of the baby at 76 degree centigrade, which is easy to clean, easy to carry, easy to run and operate, prevent infection. This is embrass nest. This is for transfer preterm from primary health care facility to a advanced national hospital because others are very minute and I can't be able to manage it in my health care facility require neonatologist to see because I work in as a team. So one of the this is the dreams, the dreams come true after only one. <laughs> One baby is my mutual from Naberera to Mount Meru is 400 kilometers. So the babies die at the ambulance when you're reaching at the Bechumin Road. So that I uh, was thinking how I can do any five to do to make this. This year, uh, able to keep in the baby walk from primary seven hours. It's using paraffin wax, soaked over there. And then one somewhere and then able to they can't allow baby to lose temperature by any means because they are made with plastic and something like and soft. This is the angle market. So 
This angle mark here used to open the, to extend head and neck of a baby born with significant imbricks and immediately after born. Because no one can prevent it, maybe perinatal asphyxia. So you can see the, the traction is like that. We have been used it and we rescue more than 1,000 babies for three years at the facility. Market is like that one. So registrations already we have patent company registration and the other uh, requirements. So our this is our team. This is Emmanuel Mushi Clinician, head of maternal and newborn medical health center, Damasin Benamija. This is the industrial engineering, Islamic Rwanda, is my partner. We're working together as a he is a project team. So um in up there and turn up. Thank you, Emmanuel. So Specifically, if anyone could help what would you need help with and what can you offer this? Now I'm tired, you know, I'm working for 10 years with this working with you know maternal agents in primary health care facility in Africa. Very dangerous. Now I'm fractured in my leg, I'm fractured in my tooth. I working with Plates in my leg and in my tooth, so getting this the best day. So I need to looking for partnership skills, designing, and so on, so that you can bring this, so that you can save the babies in Tanzania in the cheapest way because babies are dying. And if, if, if a man gets a chance to be pregnant for two minutes, do we save the baby, the pregnant woman with their babies for the whole of their life? Because in as any pain as a, a woman being a pregnant, so, so full of African culture, gender bars, vite, and then come to lost your kids, mentally, psycholo psychologically torture for the whole of the of, of the life of the woman. So yani, I need it, we need to understand that I maintain the woman to be psychologically fit in the community and the community in general. And also I make the woman to live in harmony with their life as they need. And also I'm working with gender based violence if you want to know me. Try to beat the woman. I yeah, have hanging more than 10 for the, they yeah, are being hanging for life in prison with you know, that because there are things which are going there without him. I don't know where those people are coming, but he yeah, are them. I work on that for the first time, then I come to that. So I make this fear to be good. I need the woman to bring their babies to the world, the angels of the world, the flowers of the world. But how can I do? Help me with, I need only 50 USD for scaling up this and taking part of that. 50 USD. 50 USD. 50,000 USD. Yeah. <laughs> All I mean, because I take the charger. You know me, I'm a charger. I'm like, he, I'm moving like that. Is it right to the same in the degrees and rotate? Yeah. 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 Any questions, Daniel? Actually, uh, you have a working for, uh, device. So those devices are used in, uh, in, the, in the hospital. Uh, this device are used in those to from 2018, and they are being congratulated by Prime Minister and the Prime Minister recognizing as the first Tanzania health care clinician to invent this, and the improve them and change the mindset of our doctors even though no matter how much you have in your brain you much to use it in a proper way so that you can save life because you know i'm not i'm risking more than 60 60 60 
women who are required to die total, even those are stigmatized to die. I don't like that. I take the woman with policy tracking to KCMC and all gynecologists, all pathologists, they come to see the woman, try to save the woman. For seven months, the woman was coming again. Called the, uh, he called the Mary Meshukumo. Even in the college, I rescued the woman with risk management with my blood, my blood because no blood, the woman suffering from PPH and DIC and the transvascular group. So I love to tell like that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. One last question, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, move on. Okay. Okay, that, that comes from us, uh, from me, from Guy. My name is Guy. Uh, congratulations to the presentation, and I highly value your dedication, commitment, and um, ownership towards what you do. It's impressive. So if I understand you well, what you're searching is $50,000. Uh, we, uh, we have a business model and solution plan, but uh, we expect to rise uh, uh, one 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 thousand USD one thousand USD in order to have in a proper position to scale up because this solution are required in in different countries in East Africa and sub saharan countries. So we needed to rise up that for 50, 50 thousand USD is the initial of that because there is Reprototyping the product, redesigning, and that will go to the second phase for needing 1,000 USD to go into the market. Okay, but okay, let, but the example if I would give you a, a 50,000, what do I get in exchange? Is that a grant or is that equity or some kind of uh, income contribution towards every device sold? What, does, what would I, as an investor, get back from you? Is it the grant that you expect, or what? What? What would you expect from me? For for all we want, because you have now tightened, maybe you want you to be maybe to provide you with you expect it from me. The only five percent, or you expect it from me to give me grants or or, or capital. I should understand. I should declare to your principal because I don't. I don't campaign for the money. I campaign to save the life. That is all about my vision. All right. I think a, a conversation for Emmanuel's return to Tanzania about yeah. how much he'd like to share for his fifty thousand. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Hello, my name is Michele Gregorini. I am the CEO and founder of Jaxo. Jaxo is an EPH based spin off. We are three co founders, myself and my colleague, and our professor is also a team member. And today we have quite a big team of 11 people uh, in all sorts of fields from engineering to biology, regulatory, and so on. And what we do is that we want to develop a rapid PCR test to fight the spread of infectious diseases. We know that today there is a testing. Uh, uh, infrastructure in place, but as we have all seen during COVID, it takes quite some money and quite some time before any person can get access to an accurate molecular test, to a PCR test. And our idea is to bring the precision of PCR test to point of care settings. So we have the combination of a rapid test, which is, as we know, cost effective and very fast, but as a low quality, we combine this with the quality of a PCR, uh, molecular test, and we have all of these integrated into a point of care machine that gives you the best results, the best quality, 99.9% accurate, let's say, in a short time, 45, even 30 minutes for some applications, and at a very low price per test. We are at five to 10 dollars. We can go even lower if we increase the number of samples per test. So very, very low cost PCR test and in a relatively short time. And we can do this because we have redesigned completely the system, starting from the cartridge that contains all the PCR reagents. Thanks to our unique cartridge, we can run the test in a much shorter time. And we can also eliminate all the mixing steps for the user because all the reagents come preloaded on the cartridge 
So you don't need any, you don't even need any cold chain to store the master mix, the reagents. You just open the cartridge, which you can store at room temperature, load your sample, and start the test. This is a platform technology because where the machine is the same, it's a platform and it can be used with a different cartridges in relation to the disease that you intend to target. And in the past two years, we have developed cartridges for COVID, obviously, but not only COVID, also sexually transmitted infections, schistosomiasis, malaria, and many, many other. And we have been working very closely with the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute uh, to develop most of these cartridges, which we have also tested in some European and African countries. The workflow is extremely simple. As I mentioned, almost zero and some time, you load the sample onto the cartridge, load the cartridge onto the machine, and wait for the results. And this allows us also to work with a variety of samples from saliva, blood, urine, and, and more. Because we have a sample extraction step inside the machine, therefore we can really accommodate quite uh, a variety of samples. And our idea is really to develop this kind of Nespresso system, cartridge-based, no hands-on time, short time to results. And today, uh, I would like also to mention that in addition to virus and bacteria, we have been working on the use of our platform also to measure drugs and proteins. And this means that we can quantify pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and nephrotoxicity for a given drug, and therefore you it as a feedback for therapeutic drug monitoring. This is a different application uh, with respect to diagnostics, still in R&D, but it's a future development that we are now taking with the platform. Our first uh, use, our first application of this, uh, of this different use of the machine will be a cartridge to monitor vancomycin and therefore reduce the antimicrobial resistance and acute, acute kidney disease or injury. Okay, with this, I would like to thank you. Now my ask. We have been uh, running several projects in several countries, from Europe to even South America and in many uh, African countries. We are always looking for partners to test our technology in the field, to see what could be useful for, what kind of test uh, you would be interested in running, or what kind of feedback we get from real-world users. So this is my ask and what we can offer. We have been uh, bringing uh, one first uh, medical device to the market. That means we went through the full regulatory workflow and our COVID cartridge is now CEIVD, which uh, obviously is a certification in Europe. I believe in most uh, uh, African countries, you accept the FDA or, or CE, it depends, but we can share our experience in terms of uh, pain or workflow to get one product certified and launched on the market. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So you mentioned that the time for the PCR part, you also mentioned that there's an extraction component. How, how long does the extraction component of the yeah. blood take? So what's the total sample to answer? 45 minutes is what we target as a total sample to answer time. The PCR can go as little as 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, so about half the 15, 20 minutes for extraction. Correct, roughly. Depends on the disease, but roughly, yes. Thank you, had another question? Me, what you can assist you? I would like to say that wherever, do wherever you do that, I should be familiar with serpent testing in Tanzania. I don't want to get feedback because I'm working in public service. I should be take it. We should be make sure we have a communication that can bring back it. Then I start to test it at my, then we have two labs. We have main labs. With Genix and the and the and the sub labs, so there is one is Genix part, and I think this should be there. Thank you. Yeah, I can uh, can talk with people. They can use the machine. They can provide you feedback. It's a lot. matter of instruction how to use it. Uh, yeah. Super. We love that. So let's be in touch after the talk. Yeah. This. Yeah, so wh why, why have you decided to use the cartilage and not other material like glass or something like that? So we, the question is why we want to use a cartridge-based system, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, so our idea is to reduce the hands-on time for the user. We want to ideally bring it also to context where maybe the user is not well-trained or maybe we uh, we don't have a full full-scale laboratory. So we want to move the complexity to the machine and eliminate all the mixing steps. So you don't have to think how many, what, um, what, what amount of muscle mix or primers or so to use. Just like an espresso, right? We want to give you something, you just load your sample and, and get. Please. 
Yeah, maybe uh, uh, I think this is, is a very developed technology. Uh, it is very reliable to low and middle income countries, but how do you assure the maintenance of the devices after bringing to low and middle income countries? Yeah, good topic. So as a small startup now, we plan to keep the production uh, in one place, which may be Europe or anywhere else, but in one place. And then we have to have a maintenance program where we either train the people remotely or we have our local support team. Ideally, in the future, we could also think of having some local manufacturing centers and the associated maintenance. The whole technology is relatively simple. There are some key steps that we may want to maintain in one place only, but the production of the cartridges and so can be easily deployed. So short answer, at the beginning, it will be centralized, and we hope to, to be able to do some maintenance remotely. In the long term, we hope to have some local centers. Um, so it looks like you've got, oh, sorry, I'm trying to do that, uh, 20, 20 sample wells, samples and controls, is that right? Correct. Okay. So how many um, samples do you run at one time? Very good. We can run up to 20 in theory, but then you have some controls and so. So our cartridge for COVID, for example, was testing eight samples in parallel. And for each sample, we were um, having one COVID test and one internal control to check the sample extraction. So eight times two is 16, and the four residual wells were controls for the cartridge. So we go up to eight now. We can also go a bit higher, depends on how many controls you want or how many fields you can test. As a, as a rough baseline, would you say eight samples divided by the price for the cartridge Correct. is your cost per test? Correct. Okay. And what is that again, sir? We sold our offer today for the COVID cartridge is $40, $40 per cartridge divided by eight is $5 per test. Okay. Maybe the, the last question. Uh, how about uh, the sample collection procedure? Because PCR is very sensitive. We can get most of uh, 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 bias results. Like it might be work because of uh, the sample which has been corrected, collected in the correct way. So how do you offer in, in the process of sample collection for the machine to have the reliable results? Correct. So we, we start from the moment when the sample has been collected. We ask the user to use a specific sample collection kit which is one that we have been working with. The machine works with any, but we say if you use this one and if you execute the procedure correctly, we can guarantee the results. If the user doesn't use that kit or doesn't perform the sample collection correctly, then there is a risk here. So I guess the only solution would be training, maybe instructions on the machine, but the sample collection is still a user-dependent step. I agree. Okay, certainly uh, time for discussion um, during the break as well. So thank you very much. We're now um, going to move the technical issues to a different place, but Brad appears much more competent than we've been in the room. So I'm not gonna hand over to Brad Nelson from Nanoflex Robotics, um, who's one of the uh, teams that we are supporting with the Marahi program, and he'll give um, his five minute pitch um, and then questions. Over to you, Brad. Okay, thanks. I hope you, you can hear me and see my slides. I'm uh, Brad Nelson um, here at ETH and also um, uh, work with the Nanoflex Robotics people. Uh, we're interested in stroke. Stroke is the second leading cause of death in the world, and it is the leading cause of serious long-term disability. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of strokes, but 87% of strokes are caused by blood clots <laughs> in the brain. Um, and it is essential that those are recognized and uh, addressed quickly. So uh, one of the acronyms, this was something that I know in Botswana, they've recently been educating the population on. If you see your face drooping, you have arm weakness, speech difficulties, it's time to get to the nearest clinic uh, to get treated. Uh, and what we've been working on uh, over, over several years, and the company was just founded about a year ago, is a, a novel technology uh, based on using uh, uh, electromagnetic fields to guide catheters deep in the brain. Uh, there's, there's recent clinical evidence that mechanical thrombectomies, that is going in and mechanically removing these blood clots can result in uh, much improved outcomes. And so what we have is a number of patents filed uh, um, on our system of generating these complicated fields with simple uh, electromagnets that guide these catheters and uh, is able, are able to move them quite precisely. The, the real uh, benefit of this is that we're actually controlling the very tip of the catheter, which is something that um, normally the uh, surgeons are controlling this from the rear of the catheter, uh, pushing, pulling, twisting. In this case, we can, we can move it uh, uh, 
uh, as I'm showing you here in this uh, cool video, the patient then lies at the head of, of the, uh, uh, near the head of, of the electromagnetic navigation system. The catheter is inserted in the femoral artery of the patient. That little white device by the patient is an advancer that, that can be remotely controlled to push the uh, uh, the gather or guide wire in this case this is a blue the blue is a guide wire that's uh the the surgeon is looking at through a uh, fluoroscopy through x-ray radiation to guide it up this is a, going across the aortic arch here and now ascending uh through an artery uh deep into the brain it's being twisted uh with endpoint control in this way um and then the working catheter follows it's an aspiration catheter in this case basically it provides a little vacuum um, if you you'll see there's some some a lot of tortuosity everybody's uh, uh, vasculature is a little bit different there's a basic obviously a basic shape to it that's common but uh, this all is done under surgeon control this is the 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 goal right here is to reach this thrombus this is the the source of the, this patient's problem um, the guide the guide wire is then removed and the aspiration catheter uh, removes this so this is a, a company that was founded as I said about a year ago. Um, one of the advantages of our uh, 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 system is that the surgeon can be next to the patient or remove from the harmful x-ray radiation uh, just outside of the operating room, or we've actually controlled this from China, from Australia, from the East Coast, uh, throughout Europe, and even from Botswana. So this can be remotely controlled, and that's what we think one of the benefits are. We have a team of actually 15 people now uh, uh, and a very seasoned CEO for, with many years with Medtronic. Uh, but what's important to remember is that when a stroke happens, time is brain, and Nanoflex mission is to provide fast access to care to save this brain. And for thrombectomy-eligible patients, which is a majority of them, that is where you go in and mechanically remove this, you have a 90% chance of functional independence if you're treated within 150 minutes of stroke onset. That's... Uh, uh, of course, important for from a lot of for a lot of reasons for the patient and for society as well. Uh, and we think what we're trying to do is just remove the, the or uh, reduce the speed of of this, um, uh, and 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 more rapidly treat patients uh, by not having pa patients need to be transported to stroke centers. There are a limited number of stroke centers in the world, uh, even here in Europe. Um, um, uh, you, you've got to be be near one, or, or and and so that transportation can can take time. And that's one of the advantages of our system is these can be remotely remotely operated. So I've been interested uh, for quite some time in how we can do this in remote locations. Um, I've been fortunate uh, to be funded partially by the Swiss uh, Tropic and Public Health Institute. In fact, this week I have a, a team from Botswana up here. This is the Professor uh, Jamasola as well as Casolo and Lucky who, who are here now looking at our system and, and they'll be going back to Botswana next week and then we'll make a trip down there. Um, so we've been down there in, in Southern Africa um, to uh, to to look at at what is it going to take to get this into remote uh, um, locations and how we might do that. So, uh, what do we need right now? Uh, what am I looking for really is contacts. I'm interested in, in re interested remote clinics and hospitals uh, in in uh, um, lower resource settings. Researchers interested uh, in this and uh, what we can offer. We've been we're we're going through FDA right now on our on, with our device. Uh, we've been through devices through CE. Um, and I've got a good group of engineers here, a, a, a big team. So uh, we're always happy to chat and and uh, investigate projects. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, thank you for the clear um, offer and, and ask. Um, any questions from the audience or, or reactions to the to the offer or the or the ask? Go on, um, Adam. Yeah, no, I, uh, any kind of remote. Um, Operations usually require kind of low latency connections and uh, high speed internet. Are you also looking to partner with organizations that can help you provide that in low resource settings? Certainly. And I, I think that's one of the things uh, as 5G gets uh, 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 adopted around the world. You know that's one of its selling points: uh, high bandwidth, low latency. I mean, they they quote ridiculously low latencies, forty millisecond latencies. Um, uh, I know in in a lot of areas that's not been been there yet, but we all know how how uh, cell phone technology leapfrogged uh, landlines in 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 uh, Africa, and I think that uh, we can we can jump on that and and use that. We've we've actually controlled this from down at the Botswana Inter International University of Science and Technology in Palapi back here. 
Um, and if you've got a Zoom link that works, uh, that's at all usable, our system uh, would work with with those kind of speeds. So, um, uh, but but those are those are things that we 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 need to keep keep track of using things like edge computing and and some of these uh, areas. All right, thank you, Brad. We're now going to return back to the room for, I have to remember myself, um, the next presentation, which is actually Arka, who is um, going to present on his uh, innovation. Um, imagine a situation where an HIV positive patient, a female in this case, um, wants to get pregnant. Goes to a doctor, doctor does a test or two and concludes that the amount of virus in her blood is still too high. So she will have to wait uh, quite a bit longer, um, maybe change drugs, in the hopes of getting to a point where she can think about getting pregnant. This is robbing people of happiness and not just that's happiness in developed economies. In developing economies, it's robbing people of life. Um, the current day uh, method for HIV viral load diagnostics is inaccurate and inaccessible. At Unigati, we are trying to fix that. So what exactly is the viral load test? Once you go to a doctor, get an HIV test, it comes out positive. You understand that, well, you are HIV positive, but then the doctor will tell you to go get another test called viral load test, where they will take one ml of your blood, and then they will do a QRT PCR test to count the number of HIV viral particle in one ml of the plasma from the blood. Right now, uh, this is important because this, the number of viruses in the blood helps the doctor figure out the drug dosing. It is necessary for figuring out the disease prognosis in the patient, whether they are responding to the drug, whether they are not responding to the drug. It is also necessary to figure out transmissibility. So an HIV patient is considered non-transmissible as long as the number of viral particles in the blood is less than 50. Um, but the problem with the current technology is that, well, it is error prone. The sample preparation burden on this uh, QRT-PCR method is extremely high, which leads to a higher sample rejection uh, probability anywhere from one to 4%, depending on um, the method. Um, and even the best machines out there are not doing a good enough job at purifying the sample. Uh, the machines hence are huge and that makes them inaccessible. There are some effort to miniaturize them, but not with an improvement in accuracy. So this, so how does, it, what, what do I mean by what I'm saying? So currently the blood is collected in one of these vacuum tenders that most of you are um, aware of. And then it is put into a machine, something like this. Uh, the most popular ones are as big as a room, if you will, um, which is all right for a developed economy, like in Switzerland, um, where the healthcare system is quite centralized. Majority of the population lives in cities. The machine is in the hospital. You go there, give your sample, done. But now imagine a situation in the developing economies, like in India or uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where there are many small primary healthcare centers with a big population far away from the cities, right? They can't afford to have these big machines because they are too expensive. And even if they have it, they still have an error prone readout. So the need of the hour is to make accurate viral load tests accessible to the developing world, right? To this end, our solution is UniCRT, a technology where we have not tried to improve the sample preparation, not tried to make the machine smaller. We have changed the PCR chemistry. What that means is with minimal sample prep and with minimum sample management, you can use our tighter count kit um, and get dependable results in very low resource settings. In the future, we do plan to bring out a machine we are working on prototyping. So yeah, our samples, our kit, which can be run on current day machines, give you accurate uh, point of care compatible um, result. And this is ideal for low resource and low training settings. Um, our market is quite big. I guess it doesn't, we don't need to talk about how big the HIV viral, <laughs> HIV market is generally. The sad part is that it's still growing at a rate of 4% globally. Uh, we also look forward to having a mini device for labs in developing economies where they do not have massive purchase power. And the market there is growing too. Uh, if you look at the competition in this field, we can distribute the, uh, we can look at the competition in terms of how much it costs 
how long it takes, because in some settings, the time to result is important, uh, how error prone it is, and how complicated it is for the technician to get the samples going. In that regard, there are quite a few players in the market already. Um, the most popular being uh, Roche. Uh, there has been some improvement in the point of care and dump from Sepehit. But we are not making incremental, incremental progress. We are solving this problem altogether. We are currently making some revenue by uh, licensing out the technology to another company. We hope to be able to launch our viral load test kit by 2025. All of this is brought to you by me, Arka Banerjee. I did my PhD here in University of Basel. I am a co-inventor with Dr. Nitish Mittal. He is the senior scientist whose idea this was. And in our advisory board, we have Professor Mihala Zahulan, who is an expert in RNA quantification. Uh, we believe that happiness begins with good health care, and good health care is everyone's right. So help us making this true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. The first question, what do you need right now? And two, what can you offer the room? Um, so right now, we are looking, for, looking forward to understanding the patient and clinician's journey in developing country setting. We have some understanding for how it is here in Europe. Um, so yeah, I see some faces in the room uh, that could help. And uh, yeah, this is the primary thing we need right now to understand what the market really looks like beyond our coach's advice and internet. And what I can offer, what I can offer is uh, for uh, companies based here in Basel or Zurich or abroad for that matter, um, a connection with a group of students who are happy to give a pro bono consulting service for business development and market research. Why are you waiting until 2025 when we the infection? Because you will take the sample, and then we take it to the another hospital. Is he remain there for maybe one month? And he is reading from the machine. We want the pocket one. Um. Yes. Uh. It's a good question. Uh. If we, if I could, I would put the device and the kit out tomorrow. Uh, the challenge is that since we have a, a new chemistry in the test, that means the pipeline to like regulatory clearance is um, a bit more complex and expensive. Um, hence, uh, we are trying to keep a reasonable timeline. If things go right, it might be shorter, but uh, we like not to depend on luck for that. Uh, good afternoon, Ikisei. I'm Joshua Lavini Joasi, one of MBC Lambert. As a company, we are working in different sectors. <laughs> One of them is health sector, in which we are dealing with uh, lifting devices in hospitals. And uh, this we are doing in order to ensure safe uh, work environment to uh, healthcare providers. Uh, among the uh, problems which are due to uh, manual lifting of, uh, of heavy loads, uh, we're talking about patients and uh, bodies in the hospitals. One of them is orthopedic injuries which uh, this uh, is a big challenge to health providers. Uh, we are talking about a uh, nursing population in hospitals who are more than 75% women. And this is due to a uh, poor lifting of uh, heavy loads. And I can repeat again, this is due to lifting of patients and uh, bodies in hospital, hospitals, apart from uh, causing uh, hospital injuries, but also it leads to the underutilization of health facilities, hospitals, together with high demand of uh, uh, human resource. Now uh, we can go a little bit to data. And uh, this, uh, we have the data which were collected to 2017 by uh, OSHA in US. Uh, they reported uh, 7 million uh, patients undergoing uh, orthopedic injury surgeries, while uh, in this data, uh, health sector was uh, leading by 1.6, a uh, rate of 1.6, which showed that uh, health sector, which uh, we, uh, might think that it is the healthiest, healthiest place to work, but it's the one which is leading uh, with orthopedic injuries, more than even uh, construction uh, sector and um, uh, mining sector. So 
Uh, these are data from US and developed country. Now you can uh, take uh, age and conservation in the developing country like Tanzania. That means uh, it is more worse. And when uh, you see this is uh, one of the uh, problem which we are tackling is uh, lifting of bodies uh, in, uh, in body storage facilities. This now is how it looks like and people they do this activity manually, which uh, lead to uh, a lot of outcomes, which one is uh, the use of lower cabins. So the manual lifting of bodies lead to the underutilization of these facilities. And you can see this, uh, uh, this unit, they all use the lower cabin and this is for health factors for themselves and safety factors. And not all that, but also it only to the use of the, uh, of the unity, uh, plus half percent of the unit is used, despite the uh, energy charge to cool the whole system, but you only use the lower cabins. Despite that, maybe you have other people who need the same service, but still you are limited due to the, uh, you have other uh, equipment to, uh, to uh, collaborate with the, the, the cooling system, uh, the, the unit. And uh, this uh, is one of the uh, stretcher which is used to carry uh, to move these uh, bodies from uh, world to the storage facilities. As how you can see, it need not less than three people to operate it and to store people in those uh, cabins which I saw and I showed you earlier. So according to a research which was uh, made by the Waterloo University in the US, they uh, came to, uh, to the conclusion that by changing uh, this uh, manual stretcher, to the use of hydraulic uh, stretchers can reduce orthopedic injuries by more than 73%. So uh, me and my team, we came to a conclusion of designing an inbuilt uh, uh, lifting device, it's called body lifter. Although we have uh, other, uh, other, other, other products in the chain of uh, uh, body handling and patient handling, we have patient lifter together with this. So uh, this uh, machine, as you can see, you can use it to move bodies from right to the storage facility, but also you can move to uh, uh, to uh, to pile them uh, to stop them in the uh, storage unit. So uh, this uh, kind of product, I am quite sure they are uh, right in the market correctly. The Chinese must have uh, the product quite similar to this, but we have that same extra we are bringing in the table with, which is uh, the robustness. This product are robust because we are aiming sub-Saharan Africa, where is uh, the environment is totally harsh when we talk about humidity, temperature, but also the dust in the environment. So that is what we are aiming for, robustness, but also we are aiming for the compatibility to be compatible, compatible with uh, available units, the freezing unit, but also the babies and hospitals. And this applies to all our advisors which are working on, but also we are aiming for easy to operate because uh, not all people who are going to use these devices will be that uh, sophisticated in the use of this kind of device. So uh, a little bit of uh, the structure of the, uh, the uh, health institution, uh, in, in, uh, the health uh, facilities in Tanzania and Africa at large that Tanzania as a country, uh, we have more than 8,000 uh, health facilities to which not all these health facilities provided, uh, they will be a, a marketplace for our products. They are some of them, but still we have used, uh, we have uh, used in a business model to these all facilities. So uh, initially we are going to save Tanzania, but we want to uh, grow, expand it to Sadek, Southern Africa, developed countries, and later Africa, the whole Africa. So how are we going, our business model, how does it operate? Firstly, uh, we are aiming for direct sale of products to uh, these hospitals who, and health facilities, which will be uh, uh, in need of our products, but also we are going to provide renting. Because one of the big challenge currently in the uh, in the oil ecosystem is the maintaining service of these products. Mostly, you can import a product from abroad, but to maintain them is still a big challenge. So we are going to raise them so that we can provide the machine as a service. But on top of that, we are going to provide maintenance service as a different service, not only to this product but also to other products in the hospitals. Because currently, it's not a culture to maintain. Uh, to maintain this uh, medical equipment in the hospitals in the developing countries. But you want to bring that culture by providing maintenance service. Now here is where we are going to use the number of all health, health facilities in the country. But uh, now why us in personal? Uh, first, uh, uh, we have, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I have, I have strong team and partners. We are in partner with some um, of institutions who are in the market for more than 50 years. But also, we are doing our design for Australian local environment. But apart, on top of that, we use a, a, a simple technology in all our designs. 
Uh, where are we in this uh, product, which I used as example, is that we have done uh, uh, idea validation and band testing, but also currently we have a successful working prototype and we are ongoing conservation with some of stakeholders in order to help us to reach further, to make this idea go further in, uh, to meet our vision. Now uh, we are heading for uh, manufacturing of market fit product, which will be early in the, in the next year, but also in long run, the partnership and going to as I would say that our market. Now here is my team. I am the founder. I, we have engineer Henry Frankie. We have a financial planner, uh, Rachel Dipson and Justin as CMO. And what I'm asking is a partnership and collaboration. And this is our ending call. That uh, safety take a moment, but an incident lasts for life, lifetime. No one should get injured or killed for a paycheck. Please join us to improve efficient and make health sector safe for healthcare providers. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. What do you need now, and what would you offer? Uh, actually, I'll start with my offer. Uh, as I say, that we are aiming to provide uh, uh, maintenance service, not just all in our products, but to all products. So, if you're interested to supply your product in Africa, Tanzania, and large, we'll be quite open to provide that uh, service. So, you can teach us and we can provide that service to our products. Yeah. And what I hear skin flow actually. Uh, for here, of course, I saw there are some companies who pro which provide this uh, service in case to hospitals. Of course, I'd like to learn more if there is one who has contact that would be a uh, huge help. Okay, great, very collaborative. Um, back there, Adam. Um, it occurs to me that there's a potential for your product to actually save money for the health facility by um. And enabling them to fully utilize the storage facilities and also preventing uh, absence from work due to injuries. Have you done any analysis on how much money you could save them? Um, actually, uh, uh, if I go more into technique, that as uh, so I show that more than half side of the uh, like board storage is not in use. That means okay. uh, that means it is uh, it is more than half what they are using currently. But that too will depend on where we are going to mechanize the uh, the physical activity which are used, because we have like uh, body lifters and patient lifters, so it's quite different. And yeah. I congratulate myself so much because the problem is very big in Tanzania, and about ninety five percent of the healthcare professionals in the entire from public services suffer from. Arises from low pass and capital and syndrome due to that. Even though now they cannot do any gym now because they are using digital system for carrying patients and carrying body lifts. So it's can be, because we prevent the patient from disease and we are requiring themselves to be prevented themselves as infection prevention control protocol. <laughs> Wherever we're checking the emergency, for example, there was a meeting with gender-based in Africa called Hell in Simanjiro. The accident occurred. All the police working in gender-based units, department were on board, 70, 70 policemen. We, we go in there with my fractured leg to rescue those those police stuck me on the bus in the bus only four times, and the one was died over there. No any boat lifter, no anything. We take you and put you on the on the car, and it is quite a peripheral zone. So this if we have of this product, it could save us so much because you carry the patient by using our hands. Because if it is emergency, it is emergency, not looking, we are carrying here, no protection, but in the field, we will suffer from lumbar problems. Yeah. So it can help us to, to provide a cool quality and the standard service and it reduce the, the, the chance of patients dying in the in the in, in the in the in the reception because the time see the patient to take the patient from the car and then you carry it to the normal wheelchair which is not is very 
is time consuming, the patient should die. Because emergency is emergency, when we have this product, it can help us to move faster with time of saving the patient. Thank you for a, another call to action from Emmanuel. Um, and thank you, and it's great to hear that there is really an, an, a market for your product. So thank you, Joshua. Thank you. Um, the next person I'd like to uh, have on stage is actually Margot Carlin, who um, is from what we described, I think, in the invitation as the broader Basel global health community. So. Margot, tell us a little bit about Business for Health Solutions. Thanks very much, Doug. Thanks very much, everybody. It's really great to be here today uh, and to hear some of the great things that you're working on. Um, I'm representing an organisation that's more an enabler of people like you, so I'm not pitching um, the same way that you are, a little bit different. So, all right, so I represent an organisation called Business for Health Solutions. And our mission is to increase um, access to healthcare in Africa by building the capacity of uh, healthcare enterprises. Um, we are a nonprofit organization ourselves. We're a small virtual team. I'm the only person that's based here in Basel. Most of the team are based uh, in Africa, in East and West Africa. And we facilitate remote technical assistance for private sector enterprises uh, through leveraging corporate volunteers. And a bit of a busy slide here, but down the left-hand side, in essence, what we're doing is we are working with pools of what we call clients, with enterprises, to understand like, what their business and technical needs and challenges are. So we're totally demand-driven. We've got nothing that we're selling. We're just going out and listening uh, and hearing like, what's preventing you from growing, uh, what's preventing you from reaching more patients, what's preventing you from getting your solutions out there, what's preventing you from developing your solutions. And then we try to find experts uh, that we can then match to you and help you on that journey. So it's a very sustainable solution because we're building the skills and the lasting expertise in the organizations. And then we measure it. So we're quite heavily donor funded. Uh, so one of the important things we do obviously is measure the impact that we're having. Now down the right hand side, this slide is interesting because we find that when we pitch to particularly our corporate partners, but also surprisingly to donors, they don't really get why we're supporting the private sector. Uh, so it's really cool to be here today and hear all about these private sector solutions because you know a lot of the innovation is coming from you uh, and from the sector. And we find that it is actually under supported. There is a lot of capacity building out there for uh, public sector, but also for nonprofits. Uh, and we see a gap in the private sector. So who we support, it's a very broad range uh, of clients that we have uh, all the way through the healthcare value chain, manufacturing, distribution, healthcare service providers, health tech, insurance, financing. Uh, we have clients that are like really large, well-established, decades long, uh, you know, multi-million pound revenue. Uh, but we also have like very small startup companies, uh, maybe like yourselves are a little bit larger. Uh, and we find technical expertise like in all these like, gritty areas so it's not like an accelerator program that provides uh, general business plan support or uh, you know kind of usual you know business consulting it's really what are your technical needs and so just three examples of I'd say clients that are a little bit more at the kind of innovative end of things uh, we supported a um, telehealth insurance startup in Rwanda. They were just about to go live, but we've actually cycled through two technical assistance projects with them. The first one with uh, support and actually defining and selecting the, the telehealth uh, digital product. Uh, the second aspect of the project was then looking at the insurance side of things. So we brought in insurance experts there. And then two examples in Tanzania, uh, both in the kind of uh, data zone. So Afia Intelligence, maybe some of you in the room have heard of Afia Intelligence. Uh, so they are leveraging, leveraging data to improve healthcare. Uh, they have apps and digital solutions that can be accessed through social platforms. So primarily uh, WhatsApp is the main one. And so an example of what they do is having predictive analytics for healthcare supply chain. Uh, and we've connected them to a volunteer expert who's really expert in digital health, uh, app development, but also the commercialization of that. 
and she's helped with things like value proposition, value-based costing model, um, also worked in helping them with their data policy and governance strategy. And then the next example is mobile AFIA, uh, first USSD application, uh, so using internet-free mobile technology to get basic healthcare information out in local languages. So again, starting in Tanzania, East Africa. And we've connected this team um, with a young one, one young world uh, volunteer team from Johnson & Johnson who've been helping with marketing strategy, uh, financial planning and their investment plan. So that's Business for Health Solutions, that's what we do. Um, yeah. I don't have an ask, but I have plenty to offer. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> No, I, no I, I think your I think your ask, Margot, is um, if people in the room would would like to come and talk to you and, and see if they could be one of your clients. Um, so I think that is both an ask and an offer. Yeah, exactly. Um, any questions for Margot, or would you like to grab her in the networking break? How big is your team? We're nine. Yeah. So I'm based here in Basel, one in the US, it's partnerships and fundraising. And then the rest of the team went after Paris US. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure you get way too many requests for help than you can handle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> How do you decide which to um, go with? Uh, that's a good question. You are right at the moment. It is a bit more requests than we can handle because so we've um, started in 2019. So we're in parallel building up our client portfolio, but also building up the volunteer pool and our corporate partners. Um, what's really important to us is having a client that's really able to receive uh, this advice and the support. So uh, our volunteers can't come in and do for you, but they can come in and advise. So we need, so we'll be assessing and doing diligence and point to make sure that they have uh, sufficient expertise within the team that they're actually, you know, dedicated to actually working on uh, the solution and implementing um, after that. But yeah. Good question. Yeah. How, how, how do you benefit from this? Are you like uh, charging the clients or how is it the business? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. I didn't say that actually. There, this is at no cost to the clients. So we do not charge for it. Uh, we are funded ourselves through a combination of grant funding uh, and also contributions from the corporate partners. So we're uh, through providing these volunteering opportunities, we're providing also value to the corporates that we work with them. They pay for that. Not all of them. We're working on that as well, but yeah, it's a funding source. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a very interesting approach. Uh, maybe I'll have, I have one question of what area of health are you specializing or in every, in every healthcare system? Yeah, so we're pretty much across the whole value chain now. When we started, we were focused primarily on supply chain and manufacturing because that was where our initial group of volunteers came from. Uh, this year, as we've expanded, we're supporting a lot more service providers. So we're building up our volunteer expert pool uh, in the clinical service provision as well. Uh, tech, we're getting there. We're hearing a lot of demand for like data analytics, data science. Uh, we don't have a deep pool in that at the moment. So that's something that we're trying to build up with a couple of uh, pilot partners at the moment. Right. Um, thank you, everyone who's presented so far. We're halfway through. Okay, my name is Sandra Sovi. I am one of the founders of the Plus Life CPAP. Um, CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Air Pressure. It's a machine that supports babies and premature babies who are born with respiratory distress syndrome. Um, for about 20 to 38 percent of death that occur within the first, the first about eight hours of life are attributed by the respiratory failure. And in developing countries, babies with this kind of problems, they receive mechanical ventilator support. But these these supports are very expensive and resource intensive in most of the countries, especially Tanzania. And that is why we come with. Um, we want to offer an affordable step up machine because in most referral hospitals, in Tanzania, we have about 28 referral hospitals, the whole country, the big hospitals. And most of them, they cannot afford step up machines. For about less than 10 hospitals, they can afford the step up machines that are in the market. So we want to make an affordable step up machine. At least 22 referral hospitals, they can be able to afford these machines. And also, the 
we want to make a very bit of timely maintenance within the country, even the spare parts, because one of the big challenges in Tanzania is that they may they might have the sip up machine, but to get the spare parts is kind of a problem because some of the spare parts they do not fit the babies well, and the machines they can come with spare parts, but not all the sizes. And to make it low cost, easy to use, and a portable sip up machine. Um, we were able to build uh, the prototype, which was the final functioning prototype, and by the help of the feedback that we got from the um, from the uh, medical personnel, we were able to build a prototype which included the humidifier. It was made out of locally made materials, as you can see, it is made out of food and plastics, uh, low cost production and easily set up of the machine. Um, there are current several competitors in the market, but the most competitors, I can speak of the Pumani and the Dolphin Sipap, especially the Pumani Sipap is the one from Malawi, if some of you know it. And it has proven several uh, advantages in the country that it, they have made the internal announcement that it cannot be used to premature babies or for babies who are below one kg because it, they, it causes a lot of death. And, and also the, the Pumani Sipap is lacks humidifier. So the clinicians and nurses, they have to go around after every four hours to put the drops on the baby's noses so that when they breathe, they cannot breathe the dry air. For uniqueness and benefits, our products will be locally made, low price, presence of humidifier, portable and addition of backup battery. As we know, in our country, we have a problem with electricity. Sometimes it goes off and it, it, we, we, without the backup battery, it's, it may implicate the working of the machine. And also for the benefits, there will be a variability of spare parts, maintenance on time, affordability, moist air to babies to avoid the dry, dryness of air, employment opportunity to people in the country, as if the machine is made in the country, provide employment. And at least 8% of the hospitals, they can afford it. Liberal and other local hospitals. Um, our target markets are the hospitals, the dispensaries, and medical supply stores by passing through the Ministry of Health, by collaborating with it, or it will be easy for us to enter in the market. And for the business model, we intend to do direct sales and indirect sales, that is to the health hospitals, the medical supply stores, for example, the Anoda and others, and partnership with the Ministry of Health and all health care stakeholders. And the channels that we intend to use is the National Medical Supply Department because in the country, they believe that once the device or the medical staffs are in the catalog, catalog of the MSD, it is the one to be trusted by the most of the hospitals. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Sandra. Um, we had uh, the same as before. Two questions um, for, for you. One, what do you need now? And, and what can you offer? Sorry. Oh, we've got a list. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> um, what we're looking for, we're looking for more collaborations and connection and also technical and financial support. And what we can offer is connection with a group of young entrepreneurs, the graduates, who we might help in terms of um, working with the medical devices, especially for babies and mature people. I, I actually introduced Mark very briefly while I was on mute, which was pointless. Um, but Mark Vista is a, is a professor from the Children's Hospital and may have some questions or um, anyone from the audience, any further questions for Sandra? Uh, and this is Mark. Um, this is a, a, a very important um, innovation. I discussed this with my colleague, um, Professor Sven Wehrmann, who is head of neonatology in Regensburg, one of the largest uh, centers in, uh, in Germany. Um, but I have a couple of questions. Uh, what's the ratio of or the, the, the cost of, of um, uh, you know, producing one of these devices? versus the, the asking or you know, price, what, what can, can hospitals pay? Uh, and and the reason, there's a reason why I asked this, 
it, it's one thing to deliver a device, it's another thing to maintain it, to provide a service when there are complications or defects. How are you planning to support uh, you know, a system of, of devices across different hospitals? Oh, okay. Um, the cost of these these devices, especially the one that I spoke about, the Pumani, which is the lowest one, it costs around um, three thousand USD. Yeah, and most hospitals they cannot afford that. And for the cost of uh, the production of this of our device that we have made to to be sold is uh, around uh, one thousand five hundred USD. And for the complications that occur, they occur due to different defects uh, that are on the uh, CPAP machine. For example, we cannot use the uh, money CPAP because it does not have humidifier to the babies. And the nurses have to go around if there's a few um, medical personnel in the country, not all nurses that can go all the rounds. That's why we want to include the humidifier and also to track uh, the point at which the level of water will be down. So it, it will be given the alarm system to the nurse that we are supposed to take the water now, you know, the humidifier maybe is low, something like that. And by doing rounds, or uh, maybe according to the services, doing maintenance as ourselves. Because currently this, the maintenance process, you may find the device is broken, but the thing that it has broken, maybe it is just the power system or just a small thing, but they cannot uh, maintain it because the people who have the knowledge in the country, they are very few. So they have to wait until somebody comes who has the knowledge. Do you have to train folks to use this? Is, is you know, are you planning to do a special training to use this device? Uh, yeah, we will provide uh, training, especially to the nurses who are the ones who are administering the device as part of the package once they, um, they purchase the device. So we'll be giving them, it's because we intend to make it very simple to use, even the nurse can come and understand it, but as we know, most of us, the medical personnel, they are not used with the technical things. So we will just be teaching them how to set it up and how to connect it. Just simple as that. Last question. This could be helpful because I will think one of its biggest challenge, which causes me to refer to my new children, babies, the coach, is that the alarms are lacking of surfactant in Tanzania. The government cannot be able to order that surfactant. It is very, it is very expensive, and they use uh, variable in US and German. So this, in order to make the these babies their alveolar of the lungs to open up, is by using the right there, and the the one which is available in the market, they are not able to provide humidified air. Because the lungs, the 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 lungs are need continuity humidified air in order to make alveolus to open. That's why the that preterm babies without this they suffering from see angle restriction. This one will move down when they breathe in. So according to that, the causes is the alveolus are not open like this because of lack of suffering. So, but as I remember, if I forget and don't know, like it, it's that one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Another evidence of sport. So thank you, Sandra. All right. So, what we're doing um, now is actually uh, having Thomas come on stage um, to to come and and, and talk about his. Uh, solution which is sort of similar. So feel free to um, share your presentation. Hello everyone, I'm Thomas. I'm leading the brief project and what we're trying to achieve is we want to improve critical care for patients in low resource settings by building an affordable yet high quality ventilator. And I want to start my presentation um, by showing you a picture. So what you see here is the emergency room in a rural district hospital in South Africa. It's close to the Kruger National Park um, that we visited in March this year. 
And if you've been recently to an emergency room, you'll notice that um, it might look a little bit different than Switzerland, for example, but still in general, it seems like it's in quite good shape. They're really good. If you have a little bit of a closer look, you notice that um, some things are not that well, actually. So two of the ventilators, the only two that they have, they're broken. Nobody knows why. Um, spare parts for one of the patient monitors are missing, it doesn't work. Um, the other one came donated with the wrong power supply, so it's also not working. Um, so actually, it's, it's, not, it's not that well equipped at all anymore. Um, what does that mean for your patients? If you're, if you're there, um, for example, go there and uh, say I have a car accident, which is quite common, you go there, you get delivered there as a patient, um, you're quite lucky if with the remaining equipment, people can stabilize you, um, they maybe hand bag you with a, with a, um, a bag of mask. And then if you're even luckier than someone sits with you for the next six hours in the hospital while you're being transferred to the next bigger referral center and still bagging you, you would be extremely lucky if that would happen to you. Um, however, needless to say, I guess most of the patients who get there are not so lucky. A couple of hours after I took this picture, um, a woman, I guess around 40, quite good shape, was admitted to the, to the emergency room from the female ward. Um, and I guess you know where this is going. She died simply because the doctors and the, the nurses didn't have the means actually to take care of her. And I think the, the most extreme thing, the saddest thing is that this was completely preventable. This woman is only one out of a million people in general in low and middle income countries every year have this problem, which is uh, the access to critical medical care. And I think not only since COVID, we know that ventilators play a crucial role in this. So most of the times when patients develop respiratory problems, and that's not only for COVID, but for any type of very common medical conditions, trauma, stroke, cardiac arrest, and so on. Um, ventilators are essential pieces that keep patients alive. And what the numbers say is if you look at ventilators per 100,000 people, you have about 10 times less in low income countries than you have in Europe. And I guess these ones, the problems with these ventilators, why this is the case we've heard before, I mean, most of them are very expensive. Um, they're not made for these environments, so they break easily. When they break, they're very difficult to repair. Um, they end up on these medical junkyards that you see in almost every hospital, and they're very complex. So doctors, nurses, they're overburdened by the complexity. And Again, this is not a problem that affects like even a single country, but 85% of the world population live in low and middle income countries and are potentially affected by this. Our solution to this is called the brief ventilator. Um, it's a portable ventilator that can be used in any emergency setting. So emergency rooms, ambulances, transporting patients. And again, we're trying to do something different than the conventional solutions that you find on the market. And the first one is of course, the technology that we're trying to develop in the way that users actually um, can use them. So we heard a couple of them already. So of course, we're trying to make it affordable. We want to make it as easy to use as possible, um, easy to repair. And this is one of the critical parts. So we're following a modular approach, basically like a Lego um, piece. So it comes in components and you can exchange internally components. Um, that makes it very easy to repair. Um, we're going very robust and of course, including a long battery runtime. But this is not, a, it's not about the device only. It's a systemic approach. So we're also focusing on education not only for doctors and nurses, but also for technical personnel. So we plan to integrate this whole thing into an online training platform, similar like to scan the device, you have a problem QR code and you go through a um, troubleshooting device for everyone, both technical or medical. And then the last point I think is most important to me is a collaborative approach. So we're not trying to build a ventilator and sell it, but we really wanna focus on capacity building and integrating local stakeholders into the value chain. Um, we're focusing on three things, co-production service and maintenance. The modular approach helps us here because we're not illusional and thinking we can produce a very complex device in any environment, but we're really focusing on taking that part out of the value chain that's easiest to achieve. And due to our modular approach, this is assembly. So I can tell you and show you how to assemble it with a screwdriver in 10 minutes. We're taking that one and that one scales also for a lot of countries. So we're taking this part, um, bringing it to the country. So we're bringing to technology and basically showing people how to produce. And at the same time, as we're bringing both components and spare parts, which is the same for us bring both service and repair technologies as well. So where do we stand right now? We have a fully functional prototype um, that we developed by the beginning of this year. We tested it um, in usability studies, not on patients yet. Uh, in Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, we got a lot of positive feedback there. Um, we visited 10 different healthcare uh, hospitals at all levels of the healthcare system, small, sub-county, county level, and talked to a lot of people, got very positive feedback from more than 50 people on all different levels of the healthcare systems, the CEOs, doctors, nurses, also technicians and distributors, which I find important um, because they really help us to understand uh, the way how we can deploy this. What help us right now the most, I mean, we're also currently preparing for a pre-seed funding round, um, but I'm not here to ask for funding. I'd rather ask for other things, which is collaborations, market insights and feedback. It's a global problem and I'm aware we're not gonna solve it alone. 
But yeah, anyone who has some ideas or thoughts or, or connections or collaborations, whatever, it's big organizations, small. Um, I think anything that helps. So yes, let's talk. And uh, what we offer is, is that we um, do quite some, make quite some experiences in Ghana, Kenya, and South Africa. So uh, we've developed quite a network and a lot of learnings there, which I'm of course happy to share for anyone who yeah, wants to talk. Um, and I'll stop with this. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Um, any questions from the room? Does this provide humidified air? No, the humidifier. I mean, the humidifier can be plugged in externally, but it's not an essential piece for short term emergency ventilation. You need it if you keep the patient on longer, like a couple of days or something. Then you it can be added externally. The humidification that you because you're working on ventilator, especially a emergency ventilator during COVID. So, if we don't fix it, we will be doing companies. They can put it to the patient and they refer it for 24 hours. So you need to put uh, those content from the fight packet and they, because they can cause collateral collapse of the patient. If you put the thing like that and then you are required to make sure that if the patient uses it at your own ground, maybe at the intensive care unit, the patient are required to be on intensive care unit. And if you want to call a party member, you can, it is better to join in on the team so that you can work together. Because we, we can't see, fingers are not cheap, we need to move together. That is what we yeah. 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 to follow on from what Emmanuel was saying, I guess the use case is for many of the adults then? Or... So it also goes down to pediatrics. Um, it's, it's just about a control problem, how, how you can control the, the machine. Um, neonates is a whole new case, which we're exploring for the future. But for now, it's um, pediatrics of adults, the whole patient range. All right. Thank you, Thomas. Right. Um, the next one is um, Mama Che. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Amina Yuri. I'm the co founder, I'm the founder of uh, Mama Check. Uh, Mama Check stands for Mama. Uh, in English, it's mother. So we are caring about the mother, the health of the mother, especially pregnant women. So we are developing the point of care testing for preeclampsia. Certainly, preeclampsia is a uh, 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 pregnant induced hypertension. So, it is a sudden onset problem among pregnant women when they are uh, at, uh, during the pregnancy. So, mostly during six months to uh, nine months, most of them they experience this condition. It is more common in uh, low and middle income countries. So, we have the two group uh, Mama Check and uh, Mom Diagnostics. Uh, these are the startup here in uh, Switzerland. They have developed the technology of uh, testing these uh, potential biomarkers for pregnant induced hypertension, uh, shortly preeclampsia in pregnant women. So, starting by introduction, uh, preeclampsia uh, pre is, is among of the leading cause of maternal and uh, Morbidity and mortality, and in uh, in globally, five percent of women are affected by this condition. Uh, 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 badly in sub in African country, eight percent of women are affected by this problem of preeclampsia. So it is it causes uh, more than seventy six thousand uh, global maternal mortality, and this mortality is not only for women, and it is caused direct impact to the newborn newborn babies, as majority they have to be delivered early, like premature, and premature is very hard to contain within the healthcare facility. So majority of premature premature to baby are dying each year due to the problem of preeclampsia from, from their mothers. So uh, all these deaths, uh, especially in low, in low middle income country, can be prevented by 94% because it is it needs the early detection of these uh, uh, danger uh, risky factors and proper monitoring of the uh, women with, that, with such condition. <laughs> So uh, this is the point of care testing. As I stated, uh, majority of low and middle income countries, they, uh, they need this technology because it is very different like Tanzania and Switzerland. So 
uh, Tanzania is not uh, is decentralized uh, healthcare system uh, compared to uh, the, uh, uh, Switzerland. So they need uh, they they need tests which are affordable and uh, and simple to use. As majority of the healthcare provider, they have been overwhelming with their clinical practice. So they need very simple and very affordable uh, technology to test for this condition. Also uh, immediate results. So a pregnant woman can be referred to the, the, uh, the, uh, the regional healthcare facilities for proper management. Also uh, proper uh, 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 low battery power to operate. Uh, so as you see, uh, low in middle income, there is a uh, power cut off issues. So uh, the device will be very uh, power saving uh, 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 approach and also nurses can operate. So there is no need of having the technical lab personnel to operate the test or the clinician or midwife or the nurses can, uh, can do the test. Also, uh, these are the, uh, it quantifies these ratios of uh, potential biomarkers, and it is very simple to screen the women uh, between 14, uh, 11 to 14 weeks of pregnancy, also to rule out if the uh, patient, uh, if the pregnant women have the, these symptoms from week 22, uh, week eight, for ruling out the uh, potential, these uh, risky factors of the pregnancy. So our mission is to detect more than 80% of pregnant women with this risky factor in order to avoid the life-threatening complication during uh, delivery. So uh, competitor, there is already existing product in the market, uh, for example, Roche uh, and uh, uh, other product and other uh, UK-based Lumela test. So they are testing this potential biomarkers, but it is kind of not well uh, equipped for low and middle income countries. So our solution is to bring this solution low and middle income, income countries by establishing this point of care testing. So uh, the, the current standard of care is blood pressure and proteinuria, which is total protein in blood. And it is, it is very unspecified and very unrealistic for approach. Also there is this uh, uh, FSLT ratio and placenta growth factor, which is slow and expensive. Uh, Roche has been implementing this technology for a long, for a long time, but is not uh, well compatible with the low and middle income countries. Also, there is a Lumela test, which is uh, targeted by glycosylate for the fibronating. Uh, it is among the potential biomarkers, but it's not well validated to be used under routine care. Also, there is this uh, Congo red paper, which has been uh, uh, developed in China. Also, it is within the validation process. So, BAP diagnostic will use the already existing validated biomarkers, but uh, uh, in a point of care testing at the uh, uh, health vaccine, which has no, uh, has, uh, difficult in uh, implementing these uh, very advanced technologies. So uh, the market opportunity in Tanzania specifically, we have more than 3 million of pregnant women annually and 90% uh, of this, they attend and do not visit uh, at least one. So majority of uh, this test will be implemented at the healthcare facility and more than 50% they attend at least or they all uh, and for antenatal visits. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is among of the target at the end, so there is uh, this uh, somehow uh, high uh, pregnancy rate for a thousand, and more than 50% they attend the healthcare antenatal uh, visit during. Uh, so we have two partnerships between Mama Check based in Tanzania and Mom Diagnostic based in Switzerland. So the Mama Check has the develop, have developed the, the test, which is already a validated, validated inside and it's uh, in the process of certification. So the, the role of Mama Check is running uh, validating the product and registration in Tanzania and uh, launching the market in Tanzania and come uh, across to Sub Saharan Africa. So this is the initial stage, but we, we at the end we have the technology transfer, then we can be able to produce from a uh, uh, local context. You have less than three minutes for questions. So this is uh, how uh, the partnership goes, uh, development of the test was already, validation, certification, and market launching in Tanzania. So these are the investment opportunities for validation uh, uh, and the uh, product registration in both in Tanzania and in Africa. Okay, that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, uh, a living example of Swiss-Tanzanian collaboration.
I didn't, I know Matthias, I didn't know he was doing this. That's, um, any questions? Um, this is Mark. Uh, as as Doug know, I also did uh, um, co found two startup companies, and one is Neo Predicts. And uh, we also very much interested in in PE. It's um, a major medical challenge, um, and not just in in uh, your countries but uh, worldwide. And um, uh, we are very interested in connecting with you because I think this is uh, an interesting uh, device. Uh, what we are working on is um, on algorithm um, using uh, machine learning and, and, and other methods to combine biomarkers with some other clinical or lab endpoints uh, to make an even better prediction. I mean, this is a good prediction, but it is more like screening. And um, we have to do more than that. We have to, uh, you know, come up with refined algorithms and predictions to uh, further improve management uh, of, of these um, <laughs> patients. And it's a frequent disease, as you have said, 5% in some countries up to 8%. It's a major um, um, uh, disease, not well managed these days. So yes, we would be interested in talking to you and see whether there are synergies. I I will, I'll make the introduction afterwards. Um, we had a hand up at the back of the team. Uh, yeah, so uh, you had a device there. Is there the potential for this to be a device-free test, just like a traditional lateral flow rapid? Yeah, it's lateral flow-based testing. Could it be done without the device, or is the device necessary for the ratio? Uh, it is uh, device necessary for quantification of the ratios to see if someone is higher risk or lower risk. OK. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. There is an ex TPH and future TPH person who's here to talk about um, her uh, particular solution. Virginia, you are listening to me for uh, uh, the opportunity to present our platform for the this year. So, my name is Dragos Dobre, IT system architect at Swiss TPH, uh, part of the Safar unit, and also co leading the transversal team called the Insurance Informative Group. So I will present you open with platform, but before that, I will like to start with a problem statement. So why we need open image? We'll see what it is, but the problem we face actually in low income countries is actually the healthcare service accessibility. So people are having difficulties actually because of expenses, budgets, um, access to healthcare, which are not pro, uh, close uh, to access to healthcare. So, Certain group of individuals, like small families uh, in the informal sector, they have those problems. And for that, different initiatives have popped out in the low income countries around the world, and not only uh, on universal health coverage. So, such example is the universal insurance built in Tanzania, because we are from Tanzania. I want to bring some example from Tanzania where we work there, actually. Uh, our project there uh, implemented the I said, don't tell me how to pronounce it because I'm uh, <laughs> uh, But other countries also uh, will, so develop uh, insurance, uh, healthy universal insurance bills like Gambia, like Djibouti, where they actually want to provide health insurance and uh, so free services to uh, groups of individuals. But in order to put in place uh, universal health coverage, so insurance, there is a need for digital health technology to be implemented. But there are some limitations, some uh, uh, downside on that. So typically, uh, they starting using uh, so common tools like Excel or in some real secret so even paper-based, we also saw that in some uh, context where we came into place to actually digitalize that aspect. There is also limited IT infrastructure and capacity for developing and maintaining IT solutions. So even if you have such a a solution, then you don't have much IT infrastructure, uh, and then you look on the cloud and where data is not secure. So uh, this one of the limitation and other limitation is also budget constraint in low income countries. In order to actually invest in creation of uh, new new tools or, or platform or even buy new tools or platforms. So this is where OpenEmis is coming into play. So OpenEmis has solutions. So what is OpenEmis? So OpenEmis is open source insurance management information system. It's an open source software which manages health financing processes. So it helps digitalizing the link between 
beneficiaries, you know, patient providers, and uh, payers in healthcare. So we, there is behind a community of developers, users, and implementers, what we call the Open Initiative, with a joint mission to increase and improve the universal health uh, coverage. So it's already implemented. The, well, the colors are not showing up. The gray there. So yeah, you see from here. Uh, so it is implemented in uh, many uh, African countries. As you can see, we have the biggest implementation actually in two countries in Tanzania and Nepal. And actually, I'm the technical responsible of the open implementation in Tanzania for each ISF. Um, so with the national insurance, there are many others and many other interested countries or contexts where actually they want to implement this platform. So what it does actually, the open means covers three main workflows. So the enrollment part, the enrollment officers go to families so to gather uh, and enroll them into the insurance because also again, the difficulties actually for people or person or patient actually to go to uh, the place where actually the insurance is managed. There is a health service provision where the patient or so the insurance goes to the actual health fa facilities provide to receive services, health services. Uh, and then the, the, it's all the submission of the reimbursement claims. There is a claim management workflow. So this is the main aspect of openings because there are tools like uh, managing patients, uh, hospital okay. system, EMRs, uh, the core element of open is the claim management, where all the reimbursement claims, they are treated, so they are adjudicated by uh, medical officers, um, and there is also management of the payment approval. One aspect we also introduced, so as an open source solution, is an AI-based claim adjudication to actually support medical officer into the decision making on the payment of the different claims. As example, in Nepal, there are, they have like 20,000 claims per day, and only 25 medical officers covering 1,000 claims they can review manually. So they, there is a need of the AI, um, basically on education actually to support them and concentrate on the, work, the claims actually they need to look at, which seems to be uh, potentially dangerous. And of course, last part to uh, all the reporting and monitoring aspect. Potential for scale up. So what we can do more? So the first point is to create interoperability between open image, which is a health financing social protection system with other specialized digital solutions, like for example, electronic and medical record system. The idea here is actually to provide to end user the dedicated tools where they actually use the same tools in daily life work and also in order automatically to provide information to the insurance, for example, for the reimbursement of payments, so payment reimbursement of sharing of claims. And another uh, element is integration with the payment systems. There is a bottleneck there because usually payments are uh, gathered, contribution are gathered manually, so there can be the risk of fraud. So integrating with payment systems it can reduce also fraud and facilitate payments. So faster payments, more service available at the hospital level. There is also direct interaction with beneficiary. This is also an important aspect in several contexts because beneficiary doesn't get, get information on how much benefit they have still have in their plan. Uh, if their policy have been activated, how, when will it expire? All this kind of evaluation is still missing there. And on the reciprocity part now, to close the presentation. So what we can offer, so what we do actually is feasibility missions for different digital health tools and open limits, of course, health financing and digital health expertise, implementation support, capacity building and links to the open limits global initiative. And uh, what you can help us with, it's other digital health open source tools that can implement in uh, our country's context. Local development capacity, that's an important point because this is missing in some limited resources. Countries promoting the solution, which will bring new implementation, of course, integration with other tools, as I mentioned. And also, uh, we are also looking for a training center for open image IT and health financing capacity building, which is very important for us uh, for any new implementation that will come into play uh, for them to have a centralized center where this can be done uh, easily. Thank you very much.
We'll move. To, oh, sorry. Tim has a question. What a surprise! Uh, is this is this connected to Digital Square? It's connected to uh, Link Digital Square because there were several projects with Digital Square. Actually, opening into the global good as defined by Digital Square, uh, and there were several development projects which were funded through Digital Square, where we actually did some work of further integration, integrating fire protocol within OpenIMIS as a standard integration protocol uh, and uh, developing program. AI project was through Digital Square and also the formal sector uh, coverage was done also for Digital Square. So yes, please. Okay, thank you, Dragos. Thank you. The next one is um, Korea and Rice Click. So we've got here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Puri Amini. Um, I'm the C1 co founder of Tristan. Imagine I'm asking you to take a flight which has only 10% chance of landing. Would you accept it? No. That's exactly, what's happening. <laughs> That's exactly what's happening in a world of clinical trials. 90% of the clinical trials failed, and 50% of those failures can be avoided. How? Let's go back to the flight story. Because the aircraft is a complex system, it requires an intelligence tool to check it up before it takes off. You have seen all the aircraft preparation before it takes off that the uh, pilot try to check everything with this is sophisticated tool. And this is one of the reasons that the aviation industry could reduce the number of the crashes over the years. Clinical trials are complex as well. But unlike the aircraft, we don't have any intelligence system to check them out before they start. We just write the protocol, run to execution, and start. And do amendment training and all this correction when it's too late. And as you see, we couldn't reduce the number of the crashes over the years, and the clinical trials are still risky. Um, what at risk we developed, we developed a data-driven solution by collecting all the historical data of the clinical trial from all around the world, link all this data with the publication, FDA, EMA, or whatever pieces of this trial available around the world to understand where start, where end, and what happened during the process. Then with the natural language processing, we structure the data in a structural database, and then we label them based on the success and failure, and then train a model with the machine learning that based on the similarity can predict the risk based on the similar cases. If you have a case of the HIV, for example, um, the trial, the, the, the model try to un first understand which cluster of data is the closest to you, and then predict the risk based on the historical data. Not to reinvent the wheel, learn from the past mistake and be more successful. Like this is how the, the approach that we help the pharmaceutical, biotech, medical device company to reduce the risk before they start. Um, what is the advantage for the company? They can reduce the, the, the time of the protocol development. They can increase the recruitment rate. They can reduce the amendment protocol violation and do a faster, smarter, and cheaper clinical trial, and also address the compliance to the new uh, guideline of the clinical trial, which is the quality by design. Uh, let's look, look at it. what is the impact of the, such a solution on the saving time and money on a trial. This is a real case example uh, from a pharmaceutical company in Basel. Uh, they gave us a protocol of study that started two years ago. The first version of the protocol, and they ask us to predict the risk. Of course, they know all the risks that happened during the study. And the aim was to compare our prediction with the reality to see how many of these issues we can predict. And then if we can predict these issues, how much time and money we can save for them. And you see, I don't want to go to detail the way that we do it is a risk-based approach, is a multi-layer analysis that we look at the risk in a macro, micro, and micro level. And um, in conclusion, we could predict 75% of the issue correctly, which when we 
translate it to the money and time, we could save them 40% of the budget in two years. And uh, we love optimizing clinical trials. If you want to run a clinical trial, we'd be happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Any, <laughs> any questions, comments, interest in doing a clinical trial? When you started training your model, what was your data source? So was it through pharmaceutical companies or? No, oh, there are eighty percent of the data were from public domains. Like eighteen clinical trial registering eleven sure. publication sources, FDA and other regulatory. And twenty percent we both did, but we don't have and we don't want. I mean, now everything is transparent. So it's not, it's, I mean, the, the protocol and everything, all this we need for Okay. Um, welcome to our, our visitors from the University Hospital Basel, um, which is, is why Bass is last. We're not quite there yet. Very close. Stay awake. We've got one more presentation, um, which is actually also from the TPH and, and Talia from. Thank you. And uh, thanks for inviting us to present and also to hear about the other projects. It's unfortunate we couldn't join the rest of the day because the ones that we did see were really interesting. So I regret not hearing this, but you recorded them. Yes. Excellent. Um, so my name is Heather Saltzman. I work at Swiss TPH and I coordinate similarly to Dragos, the Clinical Decision Support Systems Working Group. So what I'm presenting here is, unlike you, brilliant mind, uh, not a new idea and a company. I can't claim this idea, but it's what we do uh, here at the Institute, and we're very interested in potentially collaborating. And um, it might be familiar to some of you because um, there's, there, there's some of these projects all in Tanzania. So um, I'll have a slide on that at the end. But so I will take you into it. So we'll start with the problem. No, we will start with the problem. Uh, so there's a um, clinical decision support systems focus on clinical guidelines. So I don't know which of you um, have worked with clinical guidelines, but often they're complex. There are many of them, and also they're regularly updated. Um, that could be on a national level or an international level. And uh, as a healthcare provider, often you're really um, too busy to stay updated on the latest guidelines. And also it can be quite overwhelming uh, having to... Um, let's say, store all these guidelines in your mind and make sure that you're using the right guideline for the right patient at the right moment. So um, an, an extra point, a bonus problem, is that data collection often in health facilities is an extra burden, um, additionally time consuming for health professionals and, and uh, can be quite uh, patchy. No, sorry. Too late in the day, I don't know which direction it's forward. Um, so the, the this results in low adherence to clinical guidelines, uh, which in turn results in low quality of care and poor health outcomes. Um, this is an example, uh, just some guidelines in the Tanzanian context. Uh, so there are many, many different ones available. Um, so here for children and adolescents, for neonatal care, for community-based interventions, and all of these are quite, quite substantial. This is a summary of the problem. <laughs> and this is the solution. So uh, we create these digital, digital apps. They could be used on a, on a mobile phone or a tablet. We normally use tablets because that's bigger and it's easier to use. Uh, and it will... Um, basically guide the health professional through the, through the consultation. And this is illustrated in a bit more detail here. Um, so basically you have the, the tablet here and the clinical guidelines are, let's say, built in. I mean, they can be updated uh, when there are updated clinical guidelines, but they don't change from consultation to consultation. So they're structured in here. And then on, on the arrow we have on the right here is the information that's entered at each um, at each consultation by the healthcare provider uh, entering the patient's data. And then the result is step-by-step -step guidance through the consultation. So it could be prompting, um, measure this, uh, request X test, et cetera. And also 
then leads to a diagnostic uh, and, and uh, a treatment uh, suggestion. We're quite clear suggestions are not uh, like, um, it, it's not replacing the health provide, healthcare provider in any way. It's, it's really a support tool, um, but so it will suggest a diagnosis um, and um, treatment or, or referral, et cetera. And uh, this for our bonus problem is that it's a great source of actually routine routine data collection, uh, which can then be used for health, um, for supervision, for training, for program management, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is an example of a, a dashboard you probably can't see. Um, and does it work? Very briefly, uh, this is an overview of some evidence uh, that's come from studying clinical decision support systems. Um, so improved quality of care, reduction in antibiotics. This should actually specifically read uh, more rational use of antibiotic use. So it's obviously not that patients who need antibiotics aren't getting them. We wouldn't be very proud of that, but a reduction in unnecessary antibiotics and improved knowledge and skills of health workers. Potential and challenge. So, as mentioned, there's a, lo a lot of data collected, which is uh, which partners often find very useful. Um, you can also build in a training component since it's going to be used uh, very regularly. Uh, you can have like a video, etc. So, um, it, we can scale up. I'll just mention that, that also with successful scale up. Uh, for example, in Nigeria, there's about 400 health facilities using it in a specific region. So it's really um, quite easy to, quite easy, very scalable. Um, it would notice particularly high impact in places where uh, there's less resource, less, uh, fewer skilled providers, and it's highly adaptable. So there were many different topics covered today and it can be on different clinical, clinical topics. And challenges that we have is, for example, uh, if, if the recommendation is, oh, you need to go and see a specialist, um, often that's where it stops. And this is really a challenge we're facing is following up on this referral, kind of linking with the rest of the health system and uh, interoperability, which Dragos mentioned as well. It's really in, in the, the digital health ecosystem, very increasingly important to be able to connect different parts of the digital health, um, uh, the health information ecosystem, but it's really complicated. So that's a challenge that we're facing. And connecting also with other tools, for example, um, a tool for mothers to report, I don't know, during their pregnancy, for example, their symptoms. And yeah, that's probably quite clear, this is what we do. And uh, we're interested always in working with um, local and clinical experts, implementers, people who are uh, well versed in interoperability and if anyone has brilliant <laughs> ideas for solving the real problem. And this is not touching my pitch, so if I have the time I'm going to That's okay. Thank you. Uh, so we like um Malia along with lots of the TPH have a, a long history in, in Tanzania. Um and I hope that one day Malia will stand up here and say I'm here to pitch my company that is going to bring CDSS to the world, <laughs> but um, we're waiting for that. Um, uh, any questions for Talia or on the digital health program at TPH? Or Adam, one last one. Um, I assume the app is downloaded locally, as in they don't use it from the cloud. How do you deal with rolling out updates if there's been changes to clinical guidelines? Um, and also, how do you deal with local language differences? On okay, thank you. So I will try to answer that question. If I get stuck, I'll ask our health informatics specialist here. But um, for updates, um, it requires an internet connection. Like one of the advantages is that this can also be used in facility where there's, there's no internet connection. Um, but for updates, it will be required. So then there was would be the need for like a cyclical internet connection to roll out the other. And for um for language, uh, that is a problem. Uh each different country there's the question sort of what language does it have to be? And depending on the level of the health healthcare provider, often uh, like a certain level, they will be fine with the medical terms in English. In other places, you need them in a specific language, and it also has actually implications on the app, for example. 
if you're using an alpha vet that goes in the other direction, you have to completely change the interface. So it does have implications and it's on a case by case basis. Does it require it to be connected with the database of the hospital? Because nowadays we're using to, in any database mechanism to, to monitor to attending patients because yeah. when you upload it to the database, it could be simple because any clinician or, mm -hmm. or doctor may enter in the in the HMS and the and the and the open it and see the update because you see the up you say that the update here is automatically where the things mm -hmm. the research are done or when they say they want to upgrade upgrade their things they should update it automatically from the central nuclear. Mm -hmm. So it is better to work together with the HMS this information when Definitely. so that you can combine, you can move with this together because they can put it in database because Kinesha can op cannot come to open his phone. He should open a database. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. database are in the computer. Myself, I'm sitting here, I'm attending mm -hmm. patient. I'm checking, I want to see that a, 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 a revised material, updated material from the airline. Then yeah, I can download it at the computer so that it will be good at a not, a, not, not, not time consuming. If we do that like that, because number of health care, primary health care facility connected with database system itself. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think this is part of this uh, interoperability challenge, and definitely what you're raising is really important um, because. In the end, you have data collected in different places, and you really want these systems to talk to each other. But they're very complex. Dragos is actually um, very, um, very skilled in the specific interoperability standard that's increasingly being used. But there are several different ones, and they're not used everywhere. And it's really complicated to get these systems to talk to each other. So, one of our clinical decision support system projects is exploring um, interoperability with the electronic medical record system. Um, but really, each in each place, it's going to be different and. Uh, at the moment, there's no sort of, yeah, perfect solution. Maria, one quick question. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, how many diseases guidelines do you have? Can you refer to this before all the diseases, or is yeah. it a specific diseases that you start with? Yeah. Uh, well, how is the strategy? Is it disease based guidelines? Mm. Thanks for the question. Um, it's actually it's, it's a very good question. So I, I wrote that it's it's highly adaptable, but of course the, the complexity can easily get out of hand because covering all the diseases and all the symptoms is just really, really massive. So one of the really important things is to define the scope before starting the project, and then we can step-by-step step add different sections. So most of the projects are based on integrated management of childhood illness protocols. Um, so for up to five years old, and then have been built on further from that. So it's these sort of standard guidelines and then you, you add on bits. Um, for example, uh, skin, I think, isn't included in those, but there was a, a request from the practitioners like, oh, we, we have a lot of uh, dermatological presentations. So then we, we add that component, but yeah, you really need to narrow scope. We have one project that's trying to do the entire lifespan. Um, including like maternal health and mental health and but really trying to do everything at the same time is a quite challenge. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi everyone. My name is Abbas and I am the founder of Labex Technologies. So Labex has been offering 3D printing services in Tanzania for over two years. And myself I have five years experience in 3D printing. And today I'm going to be speaking about 3D printing dental implants. Okay, so first of all, the problem, as you can see, there's uh, 400 million people in Africa who have suffered um, from oral diseases. And these diseases can lead, to, can lead to other kind of complicated factors like lung diseases, heart diseases, and so on. So while almost 400 million people have trouble uh, in getting access to the treatments, the problems. So the first one is due to the high cost of the replacements. So like this can go up to 
and the extremely long waiting times. It can wait, it can take up to three months for someone to get a single dental crown. And this is because they're imported from other countries, could be Dubai, India, sometimes China, uh, most likely China. So yeah, and after that happens, uh, you can imagine they arrive and it has a fitting error, so it doesn't fit properly. Someone might have to adjust it, but at the end of the day, um, if it doesn't adjust very well, they have to order another one again. So it's a long process. So how do we solve this? You can see where I'm going with this. Um, we're planning on 3D printing them locally in Tanzania um, using a special kind of resin, which will be able to aim these results. Um, the low production costs um, is one of the benefits which allows us to sell these crowns at less than $50, um, a faster production time. So instead of waiting two months, we can wait two hours and we can even print again at two hours, two hours again, again, again. So in a day we can make a lot. Um, due to the technology, uh, it's more accurate than the currently used systems of CNC milling. And sometimes at the local level, they're using their hand crafting. So yeah, um, this is the prototype which was made with um, normal PLA. So this is not the one that went to the patients. The white part you can see is the crowns. Um, so the competitive advantage, we have a low cost advantage, fastest lead term in the market. We're working with uh, market leading dental clinics in Tanzania. So at the moment we have eight early adopters uh, who are ready to purchase the dental crowns if we are able to get it to the market standards and regulatory approvals and all that. And this is the team. Um, as you can see, myself, a very terrible picture of me. Um, two material scientists, uh, one, dent one dental technician, a uh, 3D printing technician. Um, so you're probably wondering why the material scientists. Um, first part, we're going to start with the temporary crowns, um, as it's easier to get regulatory approval for that, and uh, then move over to the permanent crowns. And then we plan on developing our own material for the mass markets by because <laughs> our own material will make it not cheap, we make it dirt cheap, uh, but also high quality in terms of strength. It can last you know, 40 to 50 years in your mouth. So, and then we also want to move over to bones for kneecaps and facial reconstruction using 3D printing. Uh, so yeah, that's it for us. Thank you, Lars. Any questions? The usual ones, what you expect, and your oh, yeah, right. <clears throat> so, I am looking forward to collaboration. I'm looking at different aspects in which um, I can work in terms of improving the um, dental printing and in terms of materials. Also, I'm looking for financial support. Uh, this cannot not only be financial, but also in terms of equipment. So if you have um, machines that you like to recommend or donate, it's also possible. Um, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. What I can offer a lot of 3D printing advice, um, a lot of 3D printing ideas, and potential areas of collaboration within Tanzania in the 3D printing space. And um, yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, David's been, been here all night. He gets uh, one question. Yeah, I, I, I could pay uh, more attention because I'm, I'm coming from a family where both my parents are dental technicians over there, you know. But uh, I just know that there's like so many difficult um, points in the process. One is, for example, how to get a real accurate imprint for like bigger, like I don't know, English bridges or what, what are your plans? So there, there must be some, you can only work with what you get from the dentist side, I guess. Yes. Sir. And also another thing is like how to get the color correct for the patient, for example. Yeah. So um, for the first question, um, as you already answered it yourself, <laughs> um, we're working with partner dental clinics where they just send us 3D scans and we do the printing, then we give them back the printed crown. And for the shades, 
the materials we're using are going to have different shades, uh, A1, B2, and all that. If you're familiar with those terms. Uh, yeah, so. And yeah, so you can only work with uh, dental clinics that have really accurate. Um, yes, we can work with dental clinics that have 3D scans, but we can also work with dental clinics that use the old way using the impression system. Mm -hmm. And we just scan the impressions and then okay. we'll get it. Uh, what kind of material are you currently using? Because I know in Switzerland the resin fans are only allowed to be used for one year and then you can work. Yeah, so there's a Swiss company called Sarenko who developed a material called Crown Tech. And that's the one we're using at the start. But when we develop our own material, um, we'll, be, we'll be getting those numbers that I spoke about for 40 and 50 years. Okay, thank you, Abad. Um, I'd like to thank uh, you all here in person. I'd like to thank um, Zach and Samson who stayed all day and, and rest of the the Ifakara team had to come in and out. Um, thanks very much for the exchange. Thank you very much for your effort in presenting. Um, thank you for, for coming to Switzerland and thank you for um, being in Switzerland and, and helping to make some connections. So please stay around for an APRO as long as you can. And um, thank you absolutely from myself and, and the, whole, the whole team.